Hey there, welcome to First Look. Thanks for being here this week. Uh, it feels like a while since I've done this, but it really hasn't just because I did the other one early before I left for General Assembly. Um, so uh, it's good to kind of get back into the swing of things. Um, General Assembly was really interesting and it's been a kind of fascinating to watch that, um, to watch us as a denomination kind of evolve or shift, I guess you could say. I have no idea what it was like in the 80s or 90s or any of those things. Like I know that there were controversial things and there were some, there were some controversial things this time also. Um, but it's interesting that how what's controversial kind of uh, either becomes about theology, like who we are, what, who we say we are, or process. How are we going to do this? How are we going to make this happen? You know, and in that way, it feels a lot like a uh, session because sessions kind of they work out their the theology of that place uh, little by little. Uh, usually, whenever you're before you hire a pastor, you can kind of do a self evaluation of like who you are as a church, um, so that you can you know not only speak to that to candidates but also that you would hire someone who reflects who you are currently but the most of the time sessions deal with process okay we know what we want to do how are we going to do it are we going to do it fast or are we going to do it slowly or are we going to do it with this in mind or that in mind who are we going to include in the process that kind of thing and that was a lot of what i saw in in uh in this group and so it was, it was interesting to do that and to be able to like, just sort of see that happen and watch my wife, Sarah, be a commissioner and vote on things and discuss things. Um, and so that was, that was really interesting. And I'd never been to Salt Lake City and that was cool. And I got to do a little, you know, like exploring around a little bit and that was nice. So uh, kind of back in the fold and this week is another unique week because it kind of starts this three week marathon for me. Uh, this week is Highlands VBS, and we've partnered together with Highland. So, uh, like, our VBS Part One is really their their VBS week. It's an evening thing, and I'm I'm the games person. Uh, and then next week is our VBS, and so uh, a couple of folks from there will help us out, and um, some of the kids who went to that VBS, you know, sign on to come to our VBS, which is all the you know kind of a it's supposed to be collaborative and distinctive, but a lot of the same themes and that kind of thing. So uh, I'm looking forward to that, but I've got, uh, we've got VBS this week at Highland, VBS next week at Northmont, and then our mission days uh, week extravaganza. So um, all that is kind of coming down the pipe. Uh, so it'll be a busy, a busy July. So um, moving forward here, we've got, the continuation of the story of David, and we're, we're getting close to the end of this kind of exploration into the book of Sam, to the two books of Samuel. And so we're, we've explored some chapters that you probably know, and maybe a few that you don't. And this one is uh, probably one that you've heard or seen at some point along the line, some version of it. Uh, so I don't think I'm reinventing anything for you. Uh, so we have this week and we have next week. Uh, we have someone who's joining the church uh, this coming week, uh, whose name is Jason, and we're excited about that. And then, um, and so then, then the week afterward will be the last one, and then we move into the book of uh, Ephesians. So we'll do that for a few weeks uh, until kind of the end of the summer. So what we have here moving forward is um, kind of an interesting, uh, the way this worked out was kind of interesting because this, this Sunday we talked about the title of the sermon is Celebration. We're looking at David kind of celebrating. And we're celebrating a, a new member, which is nice. And so it kind of worked out that way. Uh, but this, this story, I think, um, I'm going to try to find a unique way of kind of looking at it, so I think what we might do, sorry for all the noise in the background, this is the best place for me to do that this weekend, it's just, it's the summer, and 
there's always stuff going on outside. Uh, so anyway, the uh, uh, I'm going to try to look at this passage a little bit differently than maybe you have in the past, but we'll see how it works out. You know, I just kind of go with where I'm led. So, uh, so we're in Second Samuel, chapter six, and for the sake of time, it's one through five, and then twelve through nineteen. So we're going to look at that. Um, so David, just to catch you up, David has become king. He is king, and now he's sort of making everything his own, right? So there's that element to what he's doing. And this is, not only has he chosen to create the city of Jerusalem, the city of David, um, but he has, um, now he's bringing the Ark of the Covenant, which is kind of making everything official. You know, it's the bringing of this sacred. And again, what I've, I've, I've been trying to kind of highlight is what makes David the right person when Saul was the wrong person? Especially if these are both flawed people. Um, because, you know, David is certainly someone who has, you know, many of his own flaws. And my contention has been that David understands what it means to try to be connected to the holy, right? How to embrace his role as a spiritual leader in a way that I think Saul never really did or saw or understood. So that's been the thing I've been kind of like looking at over and over again. And it, we're going to continue to look at it here in this passage. So again, this is Second Samuel chapter 6, verses 1 through 5, and then we'll skip to verse 12 through 19. We'll start 1 through 5. David again gathered all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. David and all of the people with him set out and went from uh, Baal Judah to bring up from there the Ark of God, which is called by the name of the Lord of hosts, who is enthroned on the cherubim. They carried the Ark of God on a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, were driving the new cart with the ark of God, and Ahio went in front of the, of the ark. David and all the house of Israel were dancing before the Lord with all of their might, with songs and lyres and harps and tambourines and castanets and cymbals. And then it skips down. It was told King David, the Lord has blessed the household of Obed-Edom and all that belongs to him because of the Ark of God. So David went and brought up the Ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. And when those who bore the Ark of the Lord had gone six paces, he sacrificed an ox and a fatling. David danced before the Lord with all of his might. David was girded with a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of a trumpet. And the ark of the Lord came into the city of David. And Michal, David of, a daughter of Saul, looked out of the window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. They brought in the ark of the Lord and set it in its place inside the tent that David had pitched for it. And David offered burnt offerings and offerings of well-being before the Lord. And when David had finished offering the burnt offerings and offerings of well-being, he blessed the people in the name of the, of the Lord of hosts and distributed food among all the people, the whole multitude of Israel, both men and women, to eat a cake of bread, a portion of meat, and a cake of raisins. Then all the people went back into their homes. So, okay. 
So this is this passage. Again, to try to give you a sense of how big this, this is. To place the Ark of the Covenant in Jerusalem was not just a, a logistical uh, necessity, right? This is the capital city. Everything important has to be here. That makes sense. But it's also like saying the presence of God is here with us. And to bring it here means that the place that we have chosen, the path that we have chosen, the person we have, have accepted as our king, represent to us what is holy. And I don't think, I don't think it's a, a fair comparison, but let's say we had a, a, a president who um, decided to move the capital of the United States to St. Louis, Missouri, because that president was saying that that was the most important place and that St. Louis, Missouri represented the entirety of the nation and that all that is good in our nation um, and who we are as a people can be found there. That's kind of a weird comparison, but it was the closest I could get. Well, there would be people who would be kind of shocked by that. Like, who would be like, you're, you're moving who, I mean, this is a king and not a, a president, but, um, you know, you're moving the presence of, of how we understand ourselves to this place that has never been a place that we have thought of as representative of the whole. And you're saying that this is now kind of representative of us and that the essence of what it means to be these, this people dwells in that place. And so David is, is doing this big thing by saying this is now where the presence of God dwells. And, um, and so that came with you know, a lot of emotion. Now, we'll, we'll explore this a little bit more, but Saul's daughter looking at this has there's a lot of kind of emotions to it right so Mikhail or Mikhail or Mikhail however you say her name sorry I don't I, I'm guessing at what her, her how you pronounce her name she is looking at this and there could be a couple of things that you see here in this passage that kind of make you think well why would she feel that way why, why is she so enraged by all of this? The first could be, that doesn't seem like what a king should do. Dancing and shouting and doing all those things, you know, like doing all that display, you know, being on such display. My father would have never done that, right? So there's kind of a, a sense of pride or uh, respectability or something like that. But yes. David is doing this for the glory of God and his dancing and celebration of what God is doing and, and all that. But to her, it feels like, it feels disrespectful. It feels unworthy of a king to, to do all of that. Um, you know, servants dance for entertainment or, you know, people who are, you know, they, you hire people to dance for you. But like, uh, for him to dance in a display of joy, even, you know, uh, a more sacred way seems unworthy of um, of the office, I guess you could say. And so there's some element of like, what does it mean to um, be? Uh, I guess, what does it mean to to be able to kind of be a fool for God, right? Like that's I think that's a lot of the ways that this passage has kind of been has been talked about, and that you get that, right? That David is willing to do something out of joy of following or being faithful to God that, that could potentially make him look foolish or vulnerable or, or um, undignified, right? Not strong. Um, and, you know, and so that the passage is, has often been used and talked about in a way of like, am I willing to do that? Am I willing to look foolish for God? 
and usually what that means is am I willing to live out speak up um, proclaim my faith in front of other people you know which again it, that's that's I'm not disputing that but I think it, we could look at it slightly differently or take that one step further so there's that piece of it and so I want to talk about that for a second but then there's also just the fact that um, the second piece of it is kind of what I was saying about who David is as a, as a person and a king. David is also able to embrace and live into, passionately live into, what it means to um, represent uh, this like, kind of sacred leadership in a way that Saul never did. And maybe his daughter sees that. Like, but maybe like part of her rage is knowing that like my father was never able to do that. He just he wasn't that person. Uh, at least certainly not at least in the way that he is. And that's like rubbing it, like rubbing dirt in the wound, right? It's kind of rub rubbing salt in the wound. Um, that my father is gone. This man is king. And um, you know that's just this reminder of. Uh, of his shortcomings and the fact that he's gone and you know, that kind of thing. So there's that element to David's character that I think gets lifted up in this passage. The third element is just the, the joy part because it's, you know, it talks about dancing with joy um, a couple of different times. And I think that part is, um, is a really fascinating one too. And that's, if you've heard this passage before, you've probably seen that kind of touched on. And I think it's one of those things that we're probably, it's probably really good for us to talk about, especially as like Presbyterians. Actually, you know, thinking about General Assembly was kind of a, a, a good way for me to, to think about that joy aspect. Uh, you know, in that meeting, it's, it's, you know, it's 12 hours of meetings a day, and it's, you know, long, and, and there's, there's some, like, say, controversial things, but then there's also things that are, um, you know, uh, you know, the, kind of the minutia, you know, it's like, how are we going to do this, and what are we going to do, and how are we going to make sure this works, and all that kind of stuff. And along the way, you have to be really sensitive to a lot of people's feelings, and thoughts, and you know, things that are painful, you know, to talk about, things that are, um, that bring angst and all sorts of things, you know, there's, you know, traumatic things that are talked about sometimes in people's experiences. Uh, but then the, the moderators, there's co-moderators, uh, and that's the model they use now, is they don't, they don't have one moderator, they always, um, they choose a team, they do the, and co-moderator teams. And, the co-moderators do a nice job of bringing some levity occasionally. And so there was a time when we were really, the, com the commissioners were really slogging through this, um, whatever it was they were doing. And the, sh the moderator said, okay, we're going to take a break. And so they, they took a break. They said, but as we take a break, we're all doing the electric slide, that dance that you do at weddings. And so the, the music comes on, and a whole bunch of people get up and they all start dancing. All these, you know, 40, 50, 60 year old folks are all dancing the electric slide like they're at somebody's, you know, wedding or, you know, something. And uh, it's a lot of fun. There's video you can go see of all these people doing that. And uh, they did it once or twice during the thing, just to kind of, you know, lift people's spirits and, you know, celebrate what we're doing and, and make sure that we didn't lose that sense of joy along the way. And, you know, as as people who uh, Presbyterians are thoughtful to a fault, you know, we like we joke about like committees and committees about committees, and we like process and we like to try to get it right, and we like to be thoughtful and like we like to you know think about you know the fact that we're we're not perfect, and you know we, our theology lends itself to to thinking about the places where we can fall short and. Um, 
need grace, and that kind of thing. And we don't do as good a job at looking and feeling um, kind of out of control or joy or, you know, just doing things for the sake of, of it being a, a kind of a fun, joyous thing. And that there's such great value to that. You know, it, we are, we tend to be people who value, you know, structure. Uh, you know, we, um, our leadership tends to be people who are good with, you know, finances or technical things or organization, you know, for good reason. And sometimes we forget that the, we forget the, the art and the music and the expression and the, you know, the joy of, of what it is that we do. And I think this passage lends itself to thinking about that and, and trying to lift that up. Um, and if you're going to do that, if you're going to lift that up, you know, if you're going to make more of your life about the, the joy of living and the church that we build about the, the joy of experiencing who God is and the world for what it is, um, then sometimes that means not getting getting as much done as you should be or you could be right art and music can feel less efficient when it comes to our resources and our time you know art and music are the first things to get cut from school budgets if they if something needs to get cut um, and that's not me downing science and math and writing and all those things that we should, we have to have those things um, but you know we sacrifice the practical we sacrifice the the, the joy and art and music of the world um, sometimes for the practical and so some of this passage is trying to get us to kind of remember the celebration that that's that all the practical things that we do um, that the, the art and music and the, the joy is what makes all of the practical things we do worth it, right? Um, you know, I do our taxes and I make sure that I, you know, go to work and I make sure I pay the bills and I make sure the thing, because, you know, I want to be able to live my life with some joy. And, um, you know, we often will say, um, you know, no one has ever put on their tombstone, I wish I put in more hours at work. You know, like that's never been something that people, um, you know, being able to soak in what it is that that the church can be is, um, is a really amazing gift. And having a new member um, is an amazing gift. You know, it's a gift to be able to see someone say, yeah, I don't have a lot of time, but I want to spend it with you all. I want to spend it with you all. Like, you're the people I'm choosing. And I'll commit myself in whatever ways I can to making that place better, which is amazing. So, you know, I like the idea of exploring some of that stuff. Um, and I'm hoping that I can allow it to hit home a little bit with how the service goes. And, you know, I like the fact that this fell, this particular passage not only fell on a week that we're inviting a new member, but one where I'm going from one vacation Bible school to another one, and then I'm gonna do a mission week. And that's gonna, you know, that comes with a lot of like logistics and work and all the stuff. you. You know, you've been a part of those things. Uh, but it also comes with a lot of joy. You know, it was great to do games with kids that I don't know and some that I do know. Um, and, you know, that's, and I'm going to do it again next week and then do mission stuff. And I like mission stuff. And I try to remember the joyous parts of doing this together, the community that we build together. And that's, that's a pretty wonderful thing. So I'm going to try to incorporate all that into how we do the service. So that's the, that's the goal. Okay. Well, that's what I have for this week. Uh, I hope that gives you something to kind of think through and, and 
wonder about and look at. And I know that this past week we had this very kind of contemplative passage and uh, the way I approached it with the, the stuff about loyalty, um, you were really good troopers when it came to like exploring that with me and just letting that kind of marinate. So I hope, I'm hoping that it is. Um, anyway, thank you for your feedback. Thank you for your participation. Thanks for being you. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing you next time for another first look. So until then, take care.